In the last video, I've shown how to calculate the, the energy of each orbit by adding up the kinetic and potential energy of an electron in each orbit. And these were the values that I got. And I've briefly described how um, it might be easier to represent these circular orbits as an energy level diagram where we draw a line along say a vertical axis to represent the energy of, of each orbit. So that would be uh, the lowest orbit where n equals to 1. So this line here would correspond to that smallest ring, uh, smallest orbit. The next line would be uh, uh, the next orbits and so on. And the hope is that we can calculate um, it, it is that the these lines, this the frequency of each of these lines in the hydrogen spectrum is the result of a photon emitted when, for example, um, an electron falls from a higher level to a lower level. So this energy change, this decrease in energy, um, might be converted into a, a photon energy, which is equal to hf according to Einstein's um, relation from the photoelectric effects. So if we if we know um, these two energies, we can find the difference and solve for the frequency and wavelength, and then we we would be able to calculate uh, this wave this wavelength and check if it agrees with these measured values. So these values that are written here are the measured values. That um, was the plan. How, however, there is a slight difficulty, um, which is that, you see, there are, there are so many lines. There are so many lines here. In fact, uh, as I've emphasized, there is an infinite number of lines. So any, uh, well, the line represents the energy level. So the electron could fall from any level to any level. There's an infinite number of combinations. So how do we know which ones would give these values? Well, that actually would take some guesswork. Um, but we can tell from, say, the spacings between these frequencies or wavelengths, um, you know, by try and error, uh, check, uh, co compare that. Right? We can, from each of these frequencies, we can use HF to calculate an energy. And um, when we take the differences uh, of energies of any two of these uh, of photons from any two of these lines, we might sort of uh, compare it with roughly what the differences in energies here would be, and that might give us some idea as to whether the, the transitions, that means the fall uh, of the electron takes place up there or down here, because as you can see, we have very big spacings here, which would you know, lead to a high energy photon, and we have very small spacings up there, so a four, you know, between two levels up there would just give a very uh, a small energy photon. So in any case, um, there must have been quite a bit of trial and error that Bohr might have uh, done when he made his calculations, his model, and did his calculations. So what we do know today was which are these levels that would give the the the, the answer that. I'm looking for. So in order to um to to show this, I have to redraw this more clearly. It looks a bit a bit messy at the moment. Let me clear that up. Right, I'm going to redraw this, starting from the lowest level. That's level n equals to 1, and then the next one up is n equals to 2, 
I'm not going to try to draw it to scale. Um, it, it, it gets quickly very close together and hard to see. So I'm just going to draw it um, with bigger spacing from each other. Now I need, uh, let's see, how many levels do I need? Right, one, two, three, four, nine. Oh, right, I, I wanted to show all six of those levels. So three, okay, four, five. I'll just try and show them getting closer. Not to scale, but that's the idea. So, okay, there are more levels on top. Right. Okay, and eventually what Bohr found was that in order to explain or try and calculate these uh, wavelengths, he need to consider transitions from um, the higher levels to level 2. Okay, so let's see. Um, okay, so we need to try this one from 3 to 2. Okay, so let me start with this one. Suppose that an electron falls from level this orbit number 3 to orbit number 2. Okay, and it gives out a photon. I want to find the wavelength of that photon. How can I do it? Okay. I can make use of these values. So I don't need this now. Just appear this way. Okay. So what I'll do is this. Um, for this energy, for the difference in this energy, I need to take uh, the energy of orbit 3, which is this one, minus the energy of orbit 2. So I need E that's E3 minus E2, right? I need E3 minus E2. Okay, this one. So that, that would be my energy change. Um, right, so this is the, the, the change in energy. I'll just call it delta E. So if I actually subtract those two, I would get 3.0. 2.8, that's what I found on my calculator, and in units of, let's see, 10 to the minus 19 joule. Okay, so that's what I would get. And from this value, this times this, um, we say that this is equal to, this, this is equal to, H is equal to HF. This is this is actually the HF, right? It is a decrease in energy, but it's given off as, as the photon. So therefore, it's also equal to HF. So therefore, um, if this this number is equal to HF, we can find F because we know we know H. H is the Planck's constant, 6.63 times 10 to the power of minus 34 joule second. So therefore, we can find H. Uh, I mean, we can find F. F. Now, if we... We can find f by simply dividing this by the Planck's constant. 
Okay, so if, if we do that, um, the answer we would get 4.569. Um, in units of 10 to the power of 14 hertz. Okay, a bit slow moving at the moment, quite a bit of calculations to do. And this is f, and from f we can calculate calculate lambda. We can calculate lambda because because um, you know f lambda is equal to c. Okay, so lambda is equal to um, c over f. C over f is equal to lambda. So in nanometers, if we if we do this calculation, take the speed of light, divide by f, see what we get. We get six five six point one. Six five. I had better use a different color here. Six five six point. Okay, so repeating this for um, oh right no okay yeah I I need to talk a bit about this six five six point one now if you look through these numbers you'll find that it's very close to this number okay so let me write that down this is six five six point one so it looks like we have um. We have a, got our first agreement, right? They are they are very close together. There's a slight difference here. It might be experimental error, or there might be some uh, smaller effects that that Bohr hasn't uh, that this Bohr's model has not taken into account. But in any case, that looks like a good start, right? Looks like a good start. There's one nice agreement here between the calculated value after all this trouble. And the measured value. Um, so this this is the calculated. This is calculated. Okay, as opposed to that one. This these uh, numbers there, which are measured with uh, some diffraction grating. Yes. So having obtained this, let's now press on. To, to do the next one. Now this one, this one has a lower wavelength, which means a higher frequency. And what Bohr found was that uh, he could try the transition from the next level up to level two again. Okay. So if we try this, the energy decrease would be um, okay, I call that E four energy of this one be e4 minus e2 e4 minus e2 if you take this difference um, the difference in energy would be 4.087 and then like before we can find the frequency and then find the lambda or we can just make a formula to find the lambda straight from here so in any case, we, we know how to do it, and the answer is 486.0, okay, now let's look through this, 486.0, 486.0, there, that's 486.1, that's, that's very close, 486.1, we are talking about better than 1%, in fact, better than maybe 0.1%, percent oh no that that was a zero there isn't it 0 0.6.0 okay so it's a difference of one out of nearly 500 so that's much better than one percent okay let's let's press on okay we are doing quite well actually so the next one that Bohr tried was this the transition from the next level up, but to level two again.
um, yeah, right. So the level five energy would should be would be this one. That's E five. So we need to take E five minus E two. Minus E two. So when you take the take the difference, you'll get um, a number, some number here, right? So I shan't um, bother to write that down this time. But I'll write down the final answer after you go through the steps, go through this formula to calculate lambda. What I got was 433.9. 433.9. Now let's look through this. 433.9. 433. 433.0. Okay. 433.9. It's just different by 0.1, right? Out of 434. So again, it's much better than 1%. Okay. Um, right. Let's uh, do the last one. The last one, you might imagine, would naturally be from 6 to 2. So we need to take E6, which is this energy of the 6 orbits, minus E2. E6 minus E2. So find energy difference, find F or find lambda straight away. And I actually did the calculation and I found 410.1. Okay. So let's look 410.2. Well. I think Bo must be really happy when he found this about 100 years ago. Now, if you look at this, there is an almost perfect match. Almost perfect. The, 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 the difference between calculated, calculated from this, you know, rather weird uh, model of Bo and what was measured, what has been known for 100 years before Bo. From spectral, you know, from observations of uh, light emitted by hydrogen, there is such an extremely good agreement. Now that tells us something about Bohr's model. There must be some. There must have been something right about it, in, in spite of all this outrageous uh, assumption. You know, assumption that um, the radius of the orbit can only take certain values, and you can't have values in between. And leading to the results that you can, the energies of the electron can only take all take these definite values, and you can't have energies in between. Something which is totally um, something that we we completely cannot imagine from everyday experience. All right, we we would never imagine that. You know, you, you can only run at certain speed and you can't run at some speeds in between. But in spite of all this outrageous uh, uh, and, and strange assumption, Bohr got the right result. Okay, And we already understand from the Broglie's relation that, that um, Bohr's assumption is mainly related to the assumption that there must be a whole number of waves around the orbits. Okay, and I'll just finish up by uh, just, just by mentioning that um, whereas Bohr has calculated uh, these wavelengths by considering transitions from higher orbits to this level two, the natural question would be to ask, what about other combinations? What about transitions to level one? What about transitions to level 3? What about all that infinite number of uh, uh, possibilities? Uh, where are those lines? Do they exist? Or if they exist, um, uh, do they agree with, with, uh, with what we would calculate using, using uh, similar steps? The answer is yes, 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 and yes. Right? It was so successful, 
so successful that it's difficult to uh, imagine, probably in those days. Well, the transition to, to the lowest level, the transition to the lowest level, um, produce photons that are, that has energies that are nearly double of, of what we have here, because you can see from, from these values here, the, the lowest energy value that is a lot more negative than, than, than those higher, higher up in, in the energy level. So the energy, energy difference, um, is much bigger for transitions to the lowest level. And because of that, it produces photons, uh, with, um, a lot higher frequencies and therefore wavelengths that are a lot shorter and that means that in this this spectrum right the colors that you see here are in the visible spectrum in, in the rainbow spectrum from sunlight um, so the the visible spectrum uh, in the visible spectrum purple light is already near the end of the spectrum and we would expect to find the transition to the lowest level to have much shorter wavelength than this. Okay, much as in a few times shorter. And that would bring us into the ultraviolet. Ultraviolet. And in fact, uh, and the observations of that would be a little bit more tricky. Uh, you can't see it, but you might detect it using, say, a, a phot photographic film, for example. And in fact, that has been... Uh, discovered and, and measured, uh, I think maybe around about uh, the time of war as well. And those lines and those wavelengths were found to agree again very well, probably as, as well as what we have just seen, with uh, the transitions that, that you would calculate using this met method to the lowest level. So those agree as well. And then there, there are transitions to, to uh, the level 3, and, and you can see from these levels that transitions from level 3 would have smaller energies right, because the gaps are, are a lot closer if you look at these numbers. So they will produce photons with lower frequency and therefore longer wavelengths. So that means we are talking about wavelengths up here beyond the red, meaning the infrared. Again, we can't see them, but again, they can be measured. So And it has been measured, I think, in this case, maybe some years um, after Bohr's prediction. And we can just keep going up, you know, to higher and higher uh, levels. And there are actually more and more spectrum, uh, maybe infrared and, and even longer wavelengths and so on. And a few of these series have been discovered, if, if you consider this a series. And they all agree almost perfectly with Bohr's calculation. And it was kind of a runaway success. The, the model was so successful that, that in spite of all the outrageous assumptions, people have to believe it because there must be something right about it. And as to the outrageous assumption, well, we'll talk about that in the coming videos.